Hey guys, welcome to our next podcast. We are on chapter 10, and today we're going to go over the sixth commandment, thou shall not commit adultery. Now, before we jump into the sixth commandment, let's talk about a very important virtue, chastity. Chastity is a virtue that our Lord wants for both men and women, for all of us. Now, there's some misunderstanding about what chastity is. I went ahead and Googled chastity, and Google said chastity is a state of refraining from all sexual intercourse. Uh, Big X, that's not what chastity is. Chastity is not the absence of sexuality. Chastity is not the absence of sexual actions. Chastity is the virtue, it's a virtue, a habit, of doing what's right with our sexuality. So for husband and wife, they will engage in chaste relations. For a priest or a single person, they will abstain from any kind of sexual activity. Right? Chastity is a virtue that governs every aspect of our, who we are. Virtues are meant to bring us freedom. They're, they're good habits that help us become who we were meant to be. They're rooted in our human nature. And so chastity governs every aspect of us, right? Not just our actions, but also what? Our thoughts, our feelings that we choose, the, the daydreams that we have. All these chastity is meant to cover. Chastity is meant to heal. Remember our Lord and in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew said, He who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. Right? So chastity starts in the heart, not just in the action on the outside. It starts with the inside. Now, over the last 50 years, it's important that we reflect on this. The last 50 years, there's been a movement in the world called the sexual revolution. Now, the sexual revolution has some complicated beginnings. But basically, it's a philosophy that says that people should be able and should indulge every sexual desire that comes to their mind, that comes to their imagination. And the belief is that if people don't uh, indulge every sexual desire, that they will be repressed or they will become unhealthy emotionally or psychologically. And we've seen that this has been a disaster, that the real answer to people's freedom is not to give in to every sexual desire, but is chastity. See, the problem is God, he gave us a good desire. He gave us many good desires, right? For example, he gave us desire to eat so that we can feed ourselves and stay alive. He gave us the desire for reproduction, sexual uh, desires. But these are all meant to be in their proper context. And because of original sin, these good desires go awry. These good desires go in the wrong direction. Imagine a shopping cart you have at at Champagne's and you're going down the aisle and there's that one wheel that always wants to go the wrong direction, right? It's a good wheel, it's getting the job done, but it has an inclination toward the bad things. That's, That's what happens with original sin. It takes our good desires, but inclines them in the wrong way. And so chastity is that virtue that says we are only going to be free. We're only going to be happy if we live our sexuality according to our human nature, according to God's plan. So we've seen the last 50 years when society has taken off chastity and said, do whatever you want as long as you don't harm someone. We see this brought so much pain, so much drama and so much turmoil we've seen ever since the sexual revolution we've seen increase in what divorce depression abortion a single uh wedlock mothers i mean uh single mothers uh, we've seen the uh, abuse of women we've seen a rise in um sexual abuse all these things right because if you tell people to give in to their fallen desires it's just going to feed that fallen part of our human nature, and it's not going to help us become what we're meant to be. Chastity is the only way to find true virtue. So as we go over this uh, chapter today, let's remember that key virtue of chastity. Chastity is not the absence of sexual activity. It's having uh, our sexuality have the habit of using it in our right way, which means that sexual activity is meant only within the context of marriage 
and only within the context of giving love to each other rather than taking from each other. Chastity is a virtue that makes us happy. So this brings us to natural law. Natural law is that blueprint for our own happiness. It's our own human nature that any reasonable person, whether they're religious or not, whether they're Christian or not, can come to see the truth of natural law. Now, natural law tells us, common sense tells us that what men and women are different and that men and women have sexual differences and that men and women are mutually attracted to each other. This is why there's 7 billion people on earth, right? Because by natural law, men and women want to marry each other. There's an attraction to each other. They're different. So just because men and women are different does not mean that they're not equal. The church has always said that men and women are equal in their dignity. Remember Eve came from what part of Adam? His side, not the head, not the feet, but from his side, meaning they're, they're equal from his own rib, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. But just because men and women are equal doesn't mean that they're not different. Men and women are very different in many different ways. They're different emotionally, they're different physically, they're different physiologically, they're different biologically, they're different in the way they reproduce, their reproductive systems exist. Men and women are different. There's a complementary, complementary there, meaning that men and women complete each other, that they support each other. They're meant to be together, right? You could just see if a space alien came down and witnessed men and women, they can realize, oh, wait, Men and women are meant to be together. Their marriage is meant to be with each other. So being married, husband and wives, this is part of natural law. It is natural for men and women to be attracted to each other and to marry each other. It's biological, right, obviously, and it has a divine purpose, a divine order. Now, on the other side, homosexual relations are not natural. It's very obvious by looking just at the biology, the physical parts, they don't go together. There's not a biological reason for homosexual relations. It's against God's plan, against the order of our own human nature. This is why we say homosexual relations are intrinsically disordered. That means that they're against God's plan by their very existence. There's no exception. In the same kind of way, if I eat so much that I make myself throw up, right? That is also disordered. Anytime I use a good appetite, a good desire for a wrong purpose, it is against God's plan. It gets our own happiness. Now, when husband and wives come together in the marital act and the conjugal embrace, it has a few dimensions to it. First of all, the conjugal embrace, the marital act, is meant to bring two main things, unity and procreation. Let's drill those in. Unity and procreation. Unity, it brings husband and wife together, the act, but also procreation. It's open to life. This is another reason why men cannot marry men and women cannot marry women. Only men can marry women and women can only marry men because it has a potential for procreation. Same-sex relationships do not have that potential. And since unity and Lee and procreation are part of the marital act, that means that Children that come out of this unity, out of this procreation, need a stable father and mother. So that leads to the fact, the natural law fact, that marriage and the mar marital act is meant to be within an exclusive and permanent relationship we call marriage. That sexuality expressed outside of an exclusive and permanent marriage that's open to procreation and unity would be against natural law. So these four things, let's get them kind of drilled into our heads for a second, our hearts, unity, procreation, exclusive, and permanent. These are all aspects of our sexuality and of marriage. When God created Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, he created the first man and first woman in the state of marriage. Adam and Eve were married in an exclusive and permanent bond that we call matrimony. And we hear this in Genesis chapter two, 
Lord says, therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. Husband and wife become one. It's a permanent, exclusive unity, a bond. Now, original sin, as we said earlier, came in the picture and began to blur God's original plan for marriage. Just as original sin, it kind of discolors people's perception, people's ability to see clearly. And so remember, after the original sin of Adam and Eve, all of a sudden they realized they were naked and they hid out of shame. Before the fall, they didn't have any shame of being naked because lust did not exist. They did not feel as if the other one was using them or gawking at them or desiring them in a disordered way. But now that lust has entered the picture, they clothe themselves. They hide out of their shameness. So this is an important thing to, to define right now. What is lust? Lust is not just sexual desire because husband and wives are going to have sexual desire. Lust is a disordered sexual desire, a disordered desire for and or an enjoyment of sexual pleasure. It's often, lust is often when sexual sexuality is sought for outside of procreation, outside of unity with one's spouse. So anytime when it's all about yourself or all about um, outside of the bonds of marriage, then it's always wrong. Sexuality must always include unity, procreation, and selfless love, right? Now, as Adam and Eve came out of the garden, God realized he knew that humanity was in a bad state. So he began to prepare them for his son, Jesus, the son of God. And so he gave them the old law of Moses. And we see all throughout the time of Moses and afterwards, we see instances of polygamy, right? Polygamy is when you have multiple spouses. Obviously, this is a disordered view. This is not God's original plan for marriage. Notice that God allows it in the Old Testament to some extent, but it's not God's original plan. So when Christ comes on the scene, when Jesus is born, he says, I'm restoring everything back to what it was in the beginning. The two key texts here or Matthew chapter 5, which we already said, when Christ says he who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery. So Christ is saying, look, it's not enough that you just don't commit adultery. You need to have a pure heart and a pure mind and impure imaginations and pure feelings. And then he says in Matthew chapter 19 that from the beginning, God made them male and female. That, that's a key phrase, in the beginning, the book of Genesis. Christ is restoring marriage to its original plan. See, the Jews, they allowed divorce, but Christ said no more divorce. I will give you the grace, the strength you need, not to end marriage, not to have divorce. So Christ restores everything to what it was meant to be from the beginning before original sin happened. As we said earlier, since marriage is part of creation, it's part of natural law, Jesus himself restored marriage to its original dignity and image, that means that marriage has certain purposes and certain properties. We kind of mentioned these before, but it'd be good to review them. So the purpose of marriage is unity and procreation, unity and procreation. So any action that goes against unity and or procreation is always wrong. The properties of marriage are exclusivity and indissolubility. Exclusivity means that it's only those two, that no other people are allowed to enter into that relationship. Only that one man and that one woman. Indissolubility meaning it lasts forever until one of those persons dies. So we see that marriage by its nature is exclusive, it's self-giving, and it's permanent. At this point, it would be good to review some common sins against marriage. As we said earlier, over the last 50 so years, we live in a cultural environment uh, as re that's a result of the sexual revolution. Many people have this philosophy, this idea that I should have as mu many sexual expressions as possible. And as we know, this is against our human nature, it's against our own happiness. And so, it's important to see 
that many of the habits and activities of our modern culture do not always line up with our own human nature of who we are as humans. So we're gonna go over some common sins against marriage. Number one, obviously, is divorce. And so if you look at the left side of the screen, you will notice the properties and the purposes of marriage. And we'll go through the list. We'll see how each sitting as marriage goes against either the properties and or the purposes. So divorce obviously goes against two things, unity, and it goes against indissolvability. Indissolvability means the marriage lasts forever. Divorce obviously goes against both of those. The next one, adultery. Adultery goes against unity, and it goes against what? Exclusivity. You're opening yourself to relations with someone else besides your spouse. Incest, obviously, is the same thing as adultery. It's even worse because it involves other sins against natural law. The same thing with sexual abuse. Cohabitation, now this is very, very common. Many people in our society today, they wanna have a trial run on marriage by living together before they actually tie the knot. But look, we as humans, we're not cars. We don't test drive each other. We have to have trust. We have to have good relationships. So cohabitation is a sin against all of the things on the left side of the screen. It's against unity. It's against exclusivity. It's against indissolvability because it's not a set marriage cemented in God's eyes. It's just living together. And so at one part, at any part, someone could leave and it wouldn't be against the person, other person in justice. Even the person promised to stay there because they are not married. So cohabitation, it's been proven scientifically, sociologically, that those who live together before marriage have greater rates of divorce, greater rates of marital strife. And ironically, people who cohabitate before marriage partake of the marital act less than those who didn't. Why is that? I call it the cookie jar effect. When you are a kid, your mom says, don't go in the cookie jar, and you sneak in while she's not looking and, and grab a cookie, you kind of know it's bad, and you know you're kind of excited by the fact that it's bad. But once it's no longer bad anymore, you don't want the cookie anymore. It's kind of a similar sociological phenomenon with people who cohabitate. And so they, people know in their heart that living together is a sin. And so, look, we have to be as parents, as friends, as brothers and sisters, and ourselves have to be against cohabitation. We cannot allow the people to do it we, by our actions or by allowing them to live in our house together or anything like this. We must be strong for people's happiness. The same thing with contraception. Contraception is almost as wide or even more wide today than cohabitation. Contraception is when... A husband and wife do some kind of intervention to prevent procreation. And again, this goes against something on the left column, procreation. It goes against the purposes of marriage. When you give each other in marriage, you're meant to give each other your fertility. So any kind of action that uh, for uh, stops procreation is against God's plan, against our own human nature. Lastly is IVF, in vitro fertilization. This is when uh, an embryo is made in a petri dish, an egg is taken out, sperm is taken out, and a person is made outside of the marital act. Obviously, this is wrong because it goes against unity, right? And it goes against uh, exclusivity. It involves scientists and, and, and laboratories, right? This is, this is not a good. Now, all these things on the list are mortal sins. Now, people might have a lot of questions about divorce, uh, divorce itself is a civil reality, and sometimes the church recognizes that someone might have to get divorced in order to protect their finances, to protect their kids, but that doesn't mean that the marriage is ended. The marriage is still there in the eyes of God, so if you get divorced after a valid marriage, you can't date, but you're still married to the other person, and so this is, divorce is only a civil reality, and it can only be entered into in grave circumstances, like when one partner is abusing the other and the other person needs to protect themselves financially or protect their kids. At this point, I think it would be good to cover sins against chastity. So our sexuality is meant for a purpose. It's meant for husbands and wives, for their unity and procreation. Any use of our sexuality outside of that domain is always sinful. So let me give some examples of common sins against chastity. 
One is impure thoughts. Another is impure, impure daydreams. Again, not dreams at night when you're sleeping, but having fantasies and daydreams. Another is impure glances. Another one is pornography. Another one is impure actions or relations with yourself or with other people or another person. Prostitution, abuse, rape, and all homosexual actions. All these things are mortal sins when they're chosen because they're against God's plan. They're against our own freedom. They're against our own human nature. They muddy the waters of our will and our intellect. And if you notice, the people who think most clearly in your life that you'll know are the most chaste. There's something about unchastity that clouds our thinking, that clouds our vision, that clouds our freedom. All right, I want to wrap up with just a recommendation. There's this great, awesome website called chastity.com. And it's got all kind of resources. So there's questions that you're too scared to ask your mentor, to ask your parents, to ask your priest. You can find it on this very solid Catholic website. It's got a many testimonials. It's got great books, great blogs, great audio podcasts to listen to, all kind of things, all about all the different questions, all the different things that revolve around the freedom that comes with chastity. It's very important that we don't just let this stuff come from one ear and out the other. We need to wrestle with the gospel. Right? Jesus has given us the truth. And so if we just ignore the truth, we will not be saved, right? We won't go to heaven if we ignore Christ's truth. And if we have a hard time dealing with the Christ's truth, we need to wrestle with it. Maybe try to understand it better from the inside. Keep reading. Keep praying about it. Keep asking God for faith and trust. The last thing I want to wrap up with this one recommendation, that we all read the story from the Bible of John chapter 4, verse 19. The woman at the well. So this story, Jesus meets this woman who is uh, an adulterer. She'd been married like four or five times. She was cohabitating with someone who wasn't her husband. And she was a woman who was caught in a lot of sexual sin. And Jesus leads her into freedom. Jesus leads her away from her sin. And she becomes a great dis disciple. She becomes a great evangelist. She becomes a great saint who brings people to Jesus. And this is, I think, important to realize because earlier in the talk, we talked about homosexuality. And, and when people hear that the church is against homosexual actions, they somehow falsely, I don't know how, but they falsely misread that to mean the church is against people who struggle with same-sex attraction. That's not the truth at all. Christ died for all of us. Christ wants us all to go to heaven. But in order to get to heaven, we have to follow Christ's plan for sexuality. The church is not against anyone. And so there's a danger. This is important. There's a danger in calling people gay or lesbian. Why is that? Because we should not identify people by their desires. You know, we don't call someone in any other kind of way by their desires that are not in accord with their own human nature. Someone who calls himself gay or lesbian is a child of God. And we should just call them that, a child of God. They're not a different category of human beings. We shouldn't call use these labels. Rather, as the church, we, we prefer to say same-sex attraction, right? Because it's not something that adheres inside of you, right? People who are same-sex attracted are a child of God. God has a plan for them to get to heaven if they follow his plan. We all have our own cross. We all have our own struggles, right? Some people, it's going to be with alcohol. Some people, it's going to be with anger. Some people, it's going to be with pride or envy. Everyone has a cross, right? And so we have to live God's plan. And so when our desires are out of line, we need to put them back in line with God's plan. And God will give us the grace and strength we need. And remember, if you have any questions, please remember to ask. And then one closing recommendation. I know I keep saying closing recommendations, but one more. Every morning when you wake up, pray three Hail Marys for chastity, three Hail Marys for purity. That's simple. Three Hail Marys every morning, and Our Lady will grant you the grace that you need. Amen.